VIU Online presents GEC 101 English Composition, Week 3 Theoretical Lecture, Print, Electronic, and Other Media. This lecture is presented by Dr. Laura Hills, Professor of English at Virginia International University. Many students are surprised to learn that our course in English composition includes a section on print, electronic, and other media. Back in the 1970s, when I was a college undergraduate student, there was no such thing as an electronic component to an English composition course. We wrote traditional essays and papers. We are including a module on electronic media because in reality you will be writing for electronic media in your academic and professional careers. So we would be remiss not to speak of that in this course and to give you some practice. We include this topic because electronic communication is very common today. But be careful. It's easy to fall into the habit of writing informally. As a professor of English, I have seen students use the conventions and abbreviations of social media in their formal writing. It, I suppose, became a habit in their writing, but using abbreviations, truncated forms of spelling, and other conventions of social media, that has no place in an academic paper. So when you complete writing for this course, and if you are a person who's active in social media, or if you text frequently, look at your paper carefully to make sure you haven't fallen into that trap. Tip, academic and professional messages require you to follow the conventions of standard academic English. You will also want to follow the rules of good netiquette, that's the manners, in an online setting. There are many rules of do's and don'ts for being polite in an online or electronic medium. And learning about these will behoove you well. Read up on it in our text and also pay attention as you are using electronic media. Being mindful that messages tend to be briefer in electronic media will help you stay on the good side of your readers. Sometimes audiences expect informality, such as in blogs, Facebook, Twitter, and in some text messages. You can be overly formal in electronic media, and it will make your audience suspicious of you. The medium itself is generally more relaxed. Blogs, for instance, are usually in a much more conversational tone than an academic paper. Think critically about your formal and informal electronic communication and choose wisely. Make sure that you're using the tone appropriate for your purpose and audience. You'll need to plan ahead when you create an online text that involves some formality and complexity. I know this is certainly true if you ever have to tackle something as complex as designing and writing a website. One issue with online texts is that your audience may not consume what you write linearly. Let me explain this. When you write an academic paper, the assumption is the reader begins with the first word and reads everything in the order you have presented it until the last word. But in electronic media, that is not always the case. Take a website, for instance. Someone opens a website, and we really don't know where they begin their journey or how they go from one place to another within the site. Sometimes you'll have things that you write that have links. You don't know for sure whether the person has clicked on it and has gone to the link. So you're less in control because you don't know the order or that they've gone through everything that you've presented when it is electronic. Blog, Facebook, and Twitter posts must be self-contained. You won't know if your reader has read your previous posts. 
it won't make sense to them if they haven't necessarily. So you have to write in a way that each post stands on its own, even if it builds upon material you've already presented. You may find yourself writing texts that will be recorded, edited, and uploaded as audio or video files. This is very good when you know that this is the case and you're writing for that purpose. I can tell you that I have had some of my articles turned into podcasts and I never knew when I wrote the articles that this was going to be the case. It's wonderful when you know this because you can do certain things in your text that make them fit better with audio and video presentation. For instance, you can write for the ears. The words you choose have a sound to them when spoken aloud and choosing carefully for the sound of words will make your writing that much richer. Let me give you an example. You may have studied before the concept of onomatopoeia. This is a fancy way of saying that the word sounds like what it is. In other words, a word like zip sounds like the sound of a zipper or crunch sounds like crunching or cuckoo sounds like a bird saying cuckoo. Those words are wonderful ear words. When you use them, they add so much to your audio presentation. So if you knew that you were writing for an audience that was going to hear the words, you might gravitate toward those choices more often. You also can write for the eyes. I have written this lecture for the eyes. I knew that it would be presented in video form. And so very often as I was writing, I was imagining images that would illustrate or support the points that I was making. The links you provide may or may not take your reader on a journey. You offer the road, but you don't know that the reader will definitely take it. And so the text you write has to stand with or without that detour by the reader. Good design helps attract your audience's interest and suggests that your site is worth looking at. And there are many aspects to good design, of course, but we're going to look at just a few. You may also need to write formal presentations for your classes and in your career. In fact, that's very likely to happen. A presentation of a paper is not the paper. In other words, standing up and reading your paper to someone does not truly make sense. As long as they can read, why not let them do so? So if you're going to be presenting material that you've also written as a paper, you're going to do something very different in the presentation. You're going to highlight, you're going to engage and have the presentation be more of an overview, perhaps, rather than going in depth. You want to be writing so that you are heard and remembered by your audience. You want them to walk out with your key points clearly in their minds, and you want them to have been engaged. Visuals are often an integral part of a presentation. They are not add-ons, but a means of getting your points across. And here we're going to look at those examples. Here's one. Here's an example of a visual that encourages the audience to drive defensively. You see how effective this is. The picture tells the story of why you want to be a careful driver. Here's an example of a visual that illustrates the benefits of pet ownership for children. I could talk about it, I could write about it, but this visual is extremely powerful in convincing you that it is a good thing. Here's an example of a visual that suggests why we need to keep our oceans clean. It takes something that seems perhaps a bit abstracted and makes it more concrete. Here is a visual that illustrates why it's important to find a career you can be passionate about. Looking at this unfortunate young woman, we can be pretty sure that nobody would want to be in her situation. It's very powerful. And finally, here's an example of a visual that illustrates the importance of teaching children responsibility. 
Presumably that's a dad with his little boy and he's teaching him to check the air pressure on the tire on the car that the family drives. This is much more effective than just simply saying that we need to teach responsibility to children. So you see, these examples illustrate the power of good images. You may find yourself writing multimedia presentations. And let me say right here and right now that PowerPoint is probably the most misused presentation tool. In fact, when I teach and have taught a course in oral presentation skills at Virginia International University, I never allow students to use PowerPoint because many amateurish speakers use it poorly. They rely on it to be the presentation so they can hide in the dark. And the point of a PowerPoint presentation is that it is there to support what you say. The speaker should control the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint should not control the speaker. You may have already gathered in these lectures for this course that I know what the next slide is and I am leading you through a journey. I am not being controlled by the PowerPoint. Rather, it is supporting the points that I'm trying to leave you with as the lecture for this program. You may need to give a poster presentation too. This has become a popular presentation style at professional meetings. If you find yourself giving a poster presentation, which is an exciting way to present material, simple uncluttered posters are usually easier to follow and more effective than complex ones. In fact, let me just say that's a rule that applies to pretty much all visuals. Simple and uncluttered is better than overly complex. That's why as you watch these lectures for GEC 101 you will notice my slides are uncomplicated and simple with large visuals. Visual design elements can help you keep the reader's attention and we're going to look at some of those more specifically. Familiarize yourself with basic principles of good design. So here we go. What's your focus point? A good visual tells the human eye where to look first and where to look second and in a case like the slide right in front of you there is no doubt where you're supposed to look first. It's the blue of the eye. If everything is of equal value the eye becomes confused and doesn't know where to look. So a basic principle of good design is one strong focal point. Another design principle is that you use your white space effectively. A lot of uh, people try to space out the white space, but conventional wisdom is good design bunches your white space together as it is in this illustration. If the frog were in the middle of this screen, it would not be nearly as effective. By bunching the white space, I am forcing your eye to go where I want it to go, to the frog. And that is a much more effective design. What's the number one color for business presentations? Want to take a guess? Ready? Here it is. That's right. Blue is the number one color for business presentations. It is the color people gravitate to for many reasons. It tests well with men and women. People trust it. It says business, it says serious, and yet it's appealing and attractive. If you are at a loss for what color to choose, you never go wrong with blue. Headings and subheadings should be consistent with APA style. You don't just do headings willy-nilly however you would like. Oh no, APA tells us how to do headings a first level heading, a second, and a third. And you notice there's a different type going on. First level headings, uppercase. Second level headings, upper lowercase, and boldface. Third level headings, indented. I'm sorry, I ten italicized. You see, this is all laid out for you in APA style. So consult your textbook or the APA manual to learn how to do headings if you have a large enough paper or electronic format that requires them. 
APA also describes how to caption charts, tables, and other visuals. Again, you don't do it willy-nilly as you wish. In a formal academic paper, there is a definite way to do it. Remember, visuals can enhance and support your writing, but there is no substitute for good writing. Now, this is a lesson I learned as a child. <clears throat> I'd like to share the story with you now. When I was in elementary school, every student in my class was assigned a project, a research project. And we had to do a report about a state in the United States. And how lucky was I that I got to choose the state of California. I grew up in New York, so I'd never been there and thought this was magic because California was home to Hollywood and movie stars. And I thought it was the most wonderful place that you could ever go. So I started to work on the project and realized it was hard. It was a lot of work to learn about California. But what I started to do instead was work on the cover for my report. And I had the most beautiful cover for my report about California. However, I fell so sort of short on what was inside the report. It wasn't my best work. The best work was on the cover. Well, I learned at a very young age that a fancy cover did not change the fact that the report wasn't very good. I received a very poor grade on that assignment. And that has been a lesson that has stayed with me ever since. And I share it with you so that you'll remember and learn from my folly that visuals will not take the place of good writing. Good writing is like good ditch digging you have to put some muscle into it. And some days I can tell you as a professional writer, it certainly feels that I am digging a ditch. You can't rely on the visuals and the electronics and video to substitute for content and good writing. This concludes the theoretical lecture for week three.